Good morning and welcome to Wellspring. My name is Judy Bethman and I'm part of your Sunday, June 12th service team. Early birds meet Sunday mornings at 9.30 via Zoom. The link is in the weekly email and on the website. Upcoming speakers, June 19th, Reverend Kamatara will be here. And June 26th, Dr. Edward will speak. The channeling workshop is Thursday nights at 7.30 in the Burball Social Hall. If you're not sure of what channeling is or whether you can do it, or if you're interested in it, give it a chance and you will be amazed. There are many different ways of channeling and just trying to connect with your higher self is beneficial. Tonight, Wellspring will be celebrating the quasi full moon with a barbecue starting at six o'clock. The church will provide drinks, potato salad and chips. You will need to bring what you want to barbecue and a lawn chair, but it's gonna be so flaming hot that we're probably gonna eat in the social hall. Um, bring musical instruments if you wish. You are certainly invited to come too. Uh, the New Thought Ladies Lunch and Potluck will be Thursday, June 23rd at CSL starting at 11.30. We had a board meeting last Wednesday night. We uh, report and affirm that we are in great financial shape. Erin Albrecht has resigned from the board, so we have an opening. And we are pleased to announce that Rebecca Rose has volunteered to take his place. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your dedication to Wellspring. It was designed it was decided that we do visioning quarterly, so the spiritual leadership team and the board will vision during the month of July. We're continuing to do one community event each month. So July 10th, we will have a movie night and an ice cream social. And the movie is The, the Secret Part Two. Um, did we do the New Thought Ladies Luncheon? I'm, I'm, uh, I've had that twice in my notes here. And lastly, our prayer team remains ready to serve and support you. You may submit a request via our webpage. Our prayer team meets virtually on Tuesday afternoons at 4.15 to pray with you. Consider sitting in your quiet space during that time. We know we are one in spirit, and the energy of prayer knows no limits. All right, now it's time for our invocation. So let's all take a deep breath and breathe out. Let's get all the kinks out of our neck and shoulders and back and really relax and relax into spirit. We know we are one with spirit and we invite spirit to be a part of our worship service. We know that spirit is ever present in our lives, but I think spirit likes to be invited sometimes. We thank spirit, we thank this community, we thank the world and we thank the universe for us being part of the greatness and the wholeness that is. For this, we give great, 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 great thanks. And so it is. All right, please stand and if you are able, and we're gonna sing the song of joy when you're smiling.
know, maybe we all should be crying because we need to bring on the rain, don't we? Uh, yeah. Yes, you may, you may be seated. And it's time to do our vision, mission, and affirmation. Our vision, to elevate spiritual consciousness in our world. Our mission, to support individual spiritual quests through the study, celebration, up, council, loving fellowship, and service. Our affirmation. I affirm that all my need, no? Sir, heats up. I am replenished with healing waters of love and kindness for myself and others. My faith buoys me to be a fount of compassion in tough times and in joyful times. I flow with the divine expression of my life. I've got to make a note of that. Change that in here. Okay. It's time for our special mu music with Teresa Tudry. Is that right? Did I say it right? Yeah. Tudry? <laughs> Is it T U R D? It's Teresa. Teresa. To Dury. Yeah, nobody gets it right. I mean, I'll, I'll follow you with this. And then so how do you spell your last name? Because I think the check is wrong. T-U-D-U-R-Y. It's a, it's a, it's a Basque Catalan. Oh. Um, Menorca. We were staying at a Menorca in this country. Wow. Okay. All right. This makes this all about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. I think we're on now. Sun is pouring through the trees. The lark is singing from her perch. The scent of spring is on the breeze. It's Sunday and this forest is my church. Here in these woods, alone and apart from the world's troubles and cares, I can see with my eyes, feel with my heart, that your love is everywhere. For you who drapes the meadow, you who paints the dark. Remember that God in us is one. It's as though I'd awoken from a dream to see clearly at last. Now is the only time that we have. Leave the fears and regrets to the past. And to you who drapes the metal. 
This beautiful day, the joys, the losses, the gains, and when my life finally slips away, may it be only love that remains. God in us is one. Help me now, and oh, my fellows, to remember the God in us. Thank you so much. That was so cool. <clears throat> um, today's reading is taken from Practical Metaphysics, A New Insight and Truth by Eric Butterworth. One of the things he says is, you can only become what you already are. You can only learn what you already know. What are you? You are what you can be, and what can you be? You have to decide that. God has created you in his image and likeness, so you can be what you need to be at any time, whatever the experience is. You have the capacity to deal with it, to rise above it, to be blessed by it, and to go on. You, what, you are what you can be, and what can you be? A perfect healthy, radiant expression of the living God. You can be the I amness fulfilled. This is not, however, easy to see in ourselves. We're not accustomed to seeing it in ourselves. We're accustomed to looking in a mirror. And one woman once told me, every time I go by the mirror, I look in it and I go, eh? We're accustomed to thinking of ourselves out of inferiority, out of self-disrespect, out of the vindication of the problems and limitations of life, or the idea, well, it's nice if some people have potentialities, but I don't have them. Some people jokingly say, I must have been behind the door when God passed out brains. All these ridiculous self-judgments that we are make of ourselves. We need to build up a new awareness or begin to see ourselves, as Paul says, not in the mirror darkly, but face to face. See ourselves as the I am age of the divine process. You have a God potential within you and you have to respond. And every time life presents you with a challenge of any kind, shape or form, life is asking you, who do you think you are? And you respond, I am. I am the Christ, the son of the living God. I have the capacity to deal with this, and I know that I'll get through it. I'm going to do it. I will do it easily, and I will do it well. 
I know that the res result is not placed through somebody else, but simply an acknowledgement in myself that by achieve I am achieving the divine potential that has been mine from the beginning. When we begin to deal with life on that basis, life takes on new meaning. And here's a poem by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. It's called The Creed. Whoever was begotten by pure love and came desired and welcomed into life is of immaculate conception. He whose heart is fullness of, full of tenderness and truth, who loves mankind more than he loves himself and cannot find room in his heart for hate, may be another Christ. We all may be the saviors of the world if we believe in the divinity which dwells in us and worship it, and nail our grosser selves, our tempers, greeds, and unworthy aims upon the cross. Who giveth love to all, pays kindness for unkindness, smiles for frowns, and lends a new courage to each fainting heart, and strengthens hope and scatters joy abroad. He too is a redeemer, a child of God. And now, we bring Dr. Edward. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> oh, thank you, Judy. That was a beautiful reading. The title of my talk today is Moving from Judgment to Loving, Healing, and Evolving. Walt Whitman said, be curious, not judgmental. And somebody named Anonymous said, I am grateful that I am not as judgmental as all those censorious, self-righteous people around me. <laughs> and as we used to say in our Course of Miracles on Saturdays, a judgment is a no-no. Tongue in cheek, of course. So what is judgment? Well, if you go to the dictionary, to me, it wasn't very fulfilling. I think they did it wrong. No, just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> it says the co judgment is a cognitive process of reaching a decision or drawing conclusions. It might also mean measuring something or evaluating something. Well, I think the judgment that we usually think of in, shall we say, a uh, counseling sense, if you will, or the sense we might use it here, doesn't quite fit that uh, secular definition, but that's all right. So what's, what's the big issue about judgment anyway? Well, some people say that judgment allows no true change. And often when we judge something, we're done. You know, it's kind of that one and done thing. Okay, I've, I've got that labeled. No, no reason to worry about it. And of course, some of us take great pride in not changing our minds. And once we've arrived at a judgment, we stick to it. But if we are unable to change, then we lose our spark of individuality and our uniqueness in the world. And why does it even matter if we judge or are judgmental? Well, there's a cost to being judgmental, so to speak. Every time you make a negative judgment of someone else or something, you reaffirm for yourself the fact that you live in a world where everyone judges each other all the time. In a sense, you affirm that judgment and criticism and division is the nature of the world rather than affirming that we live in a loving, supportive universe. And we all know that what we affirm, we get more of. Well, let's just take a little trip here. Who or what do we typically judge? Now, I'm going to kind of break it up into three or four groups here. 
Uh, we judge uh, others and their situations or opinions or choices. So this is external to us. We judge ourselves and what happens to us. That shouldn't be happening, right? I mean, we never say that. And we, adju we judge events in the world. And I'm going to throw in the last one here in my mind is we judge God. And I'll explain why that makes sense later. So judging others is probably the most common and the easiest form of judgment. You know, we're constantly evaluating what we see in the world. However, it's not just us. When we do that, we trigger a bunch of our past experiences and information. You know, we go to, we see an event, we go to our file cabinet, we pull out what's in there. We say, oh yeah, you know, uh-huh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's not good, yeah. And it's not only just from our own experience, but of course, those of our parents and society and past generations, some people say that this is passed on through our DNA even, uh, the, we might call it the collective consciousness. But we live in a 3D world and so when we look around, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. And this means diversity of all kinds, from minerals to diversity of species, to opinions, to behaviors. So there's a lot of opportunity to judge others out there available to us. But anyway, let's talk about judging ourselves for a minute. The, uh, some of you are familiar with something called the Essene mirrors. And the second Essene mirror is, in you, I see my biases and judgments. And some of you are familiar, I've talked of uh, Byron Katie before. She has a book that's called Loving What Is. And in that book, she has an exercise, it's called Judge Your Neighbor, which now seems kind of like a cruel thing to promote. However, what we criticize in others is actually what we perceive in ourselves. So the purposes of that exercise is really to identify what we're judging in ourselves, but in kind of a sneaky way, because if we were to be asked to judge ourselves, we would say probably, well, um, there's nothing, I'm, I'm okay. Or as soon as we start trying to judge, write down a judgment about ourselves, we're going to get defensive. Like, oh, that's horrible. I can't be like that. And so we're going to push it away. So we don't do a judge ourselves exercise. She does this judge your neighbor. And then of course she turns it around and uh, says, hey, maybe you resemble that, right? So, uh, <clears throat> and then we, we don't, I don't think we hesitate, but maybe we do to judge things or events that happen to us. You know, it's like, oh, it should be different. You know, why did this happen to me? The other day I was playing golf and uh, we had a, a one particular hole, and uh, one of the guys says, well, I should have had birdie, except, you know, I put it wrong, or what have you. And so, for the rest of that round, we kind of had this little joke going on. It's like, well, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to put down your actual score, and we're going to put down your shoulda score. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, sometimes it's fun to be that way. Yeah. Uh, the trouble with, with using our judgments as, to, uh, as a way to measure ourselves, it, it also limits how much change can enter our life. And even worse, that if we begin to judge our life, uh, shall we say unconsciously, we kind of force or push those judgments outwards and we push them onto others. Very similar to that a scene mirror I was talking about. I see my biases and judgments uh, in others. So, but, you know, if we're living from a point of judgment, then we try to, we try to hold the world in the way we think it should be. 
And uh, that gets kind of tiring. But wouldn't be, we be happier if everybody else was exactly the way we wanted them to be? Or exactly like us? <laughs> right, yeah. Well, everyone would have the same answers as we do. I mean, it'd just be like pretty vanilla all the time. I think it'd get kind of boring. You know, a lot of, uh, some of us are studying uh, the uh, past life experiences a little bit, but also what we do before we're born. And you think about, you know, we're all at the uh, typical example of heaven. We're all up in heaven on the cloud and are fully clothed. We don't have to worry about eating. We're playing our harp. And after about, what, a few centuries, that gets kind of boring. And we decide, <laughs> let's go back down to earth and let's have some experiences. Let's, let's, let's uh, shake it up a little bit. So as I said earlier, when we draw or make a judgment of someone else or even of ourselves, we very rarely want to take it back. It takes a lot of effort to withdraw that judgment. Sometimes it takes a lot of tears to withdraw that judgment. I mean, you know, think about, I mean, I, I see a lot of heads shaking, but think about the, what we talk about first impressions. You know, you make a, someone makes a first impression and that sticks with them. And we have a hard time changing our mind about that person. And the same thing goes with judgments and so forth. That's kind of like a first impression. Uh, and I talked about judging world events. Hmm. I think that's probably a common pastime these days. Uh, we've got, what, 24-hour uh, news. You can tune into any channel you want. Um, they're always feeding us uh, stories about disasters, um, nasty people, people we don't agree with, people who agree with others, all sorts of things to keep us separate from one another. And as I said, my, my last one I kind of threw in there was uh, judging God. So let me count the ways, if you will. He or she shouldn't do this or that. Fill in the blanks. I should have more money, more fame, more power, more friends. What's happening in the world is really bad. You might say that all those things are controlled by persons involved in that situation that are out of my control. But we know that everyone acts in a manner that's consistent with their beliefs. And as we say here, if, I'll turn it around. If you don't like your life, change your thinking. Right? So generalizing that to, if I don't like anything that's happening to me or to others or to the world, then I am criticizing how creation is operating and therefore how God is running things. God or spirit is operating through and around everything, everyone and every situation. As we say, God is good always. So let's just allow that as a possible option, that God is operating in, through, and around everything that we might be disagreeing with. All right, so let's kind of get out of this hole we've dug for ourselves. And uh, does judgment actually serve us in any way? Well, you might say no. But if you think about how we got here through human history, we had to evaluate others, we had to evaluate situations, and also ourselves to help us through surviving situations. If you think back to the caveman, I mean, you know, think back to uh, when you were in grade school and you were choosing teams. And I always got chosen last because I was a poor ball player, but. You know, you want your team to be the strongest, so you do have to make some kind of evaluation. All right, so that's, you know, back when we were working at the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, judging and evaluating became very important to survive. If somebody wasn't planting the crops correctly, in the sense that 
the seeds were too deep or too shallow or not enough water or what have you, perhaps the entire community would suffer from lack of food. So it was important to have those things. So down in the core, our reptilian brain, if you will, we judgment has served us very well. And so it can be very challenging and maybe even terrifying to release judgment. Because in a way, that is so deep within our consciousness. And even today, when perhaps it's still not needed, we still think that judgment or evaluation provides us a sense of security. It's a way we choose to deal with and escape from real or perceived danger. So you could say that perhaps 90% of our judgments don't serve us in any way. On the contrary, they do harm. And if you're perpetually judging and evaluating, classing and labeling and analyzing, you probably create a great deal of turbulence in your inner dialogue. Because everywhere you look is something you can have an opinion about. So when we judge we have thoughts and emotions and perhaps even deeds that create self-imposed suffering. Coming with this judgments are fear and anxiety, anger, uncertainty, and other negative emotions. And we know that that prevents the flea, free flowing of energy through us. I mean, some of us may know individuals who are rather judgmental or maybe very judgmental. Perhaps, I'm not trying to be judgmental about this, but they don't appear to be happy folks because nothing is going right for them. And, uh, you know, so they've got a busy schedule trying to, as Kamatara says, trying to out-God God. You're trying to, trying to move all the chess pieces in their life and in everybody else's life and their kid's life and their, what well, do you get it, right? Uh, so they may be trying to push their truths and beliefs onto others in, in an attempt to kind of stay in personal balance. I want, somebody once described that exercise in futility as trying to you're, keep a beach ball underwater. Well, it's not too bad when you've got one beach ball, you know, you can hold it underwater. Then somebody throws you another one and now you hold that with your legs and push the other one down and here comes a third one. Before you know it, you're overwhelmed with beach balls and you can't keep them all underwater for long. The other thing about a judgmental person or being judgmental is that we want to uh, defend ourselves against outside changes. So you might see someone who's kind of uh, an attacking type of individual. And as we just mentioned, likely not very happy individual. So if we can free ourselves from judgments, we're open to a greater expression of love towards ourselves and others. We have deeper and more meaningful connections. It helps us discover the true beauty of the world around us. But, you know, chances are we all do judge others. However, it's also we have a choice as to what we want to do with that judgment. Do we want to communicate it? Or maybe do you self-filter it and say something more palatable, express it as an opinion perhaps? Or maybe we don't say anything at all. You know, we talk sometimes about people who have no filter. It's like, whatever, I call them blurters. Oh, I don't like your hair. Oh, you know, it's like, look, <laughs> chill. Anyway. All right, so enough of that. Let's talk about uh, something I found. It uh, was new to me, and it kind of summarized things very nicely. It's called the five non-judgmental mindfulness activities. Some of you have heard of mindfulness before, of course. The first one is to observe your judgment. Mindfulness involves an attitude of radical acceptance and detached observation of the present moment. Hmm. 
Sounds a lot like uh, the books we've been reading in Early Birds, The Power of Now and The Untethered Soul, right? Be in the moment, be that observer, kind of the one behind you, watching you have your experiences. So when we have a thought, an emotion, and we can learn by just observing them, and, you know, we might identify that our mind wants to label that as good or bad. But be the observer. Second, understand deeply the roots of our judgment. In addition to observing our judgments, to be in a non-judgmental state, we need to mindfully understand deeply why we have them. As a matter of fact, uh, probably more than we even imagine, we're conditioned by our environment. The opinions and thinking of our family, our friends, and the society ever since our birth. Oh, we observed that. Oh, wonder where that came from. And also, as I mentioned, kind of the idea of the DNA, even in our cells, we have uh, the physiological changes that we've inherited this sense of fear and anxiety and suffering, maybe from our grandparents and so forth. And again, all of humans, humankind, animal, plant, and uh, mineral ancestors, if you want to go that far. So, if we observe it, we can begin to examine it and we can understand perhaps a little bit more about what's going on. And Recognize the value of diversity, and I kind of touched on this a little bit, but when we understand the value of diversity, we can release ourselves from judgment as well. The idea of good or bad loses its meaning. It just is. Everything has a reason to exist, and even bad things that happen to us, and I quote, bad things that happen to us have a reason for existing. Uh, Esther Hicks, who you all know, probably know of uh, the author of the Abraham, uh, once said, the diversity of things, including bad things, helps us know our personal preferences. How do we know what we do like if we don't know what we don't like? The diversity helps us identify what we desire, and knowing our desire is the first step in allowing what we want. Therefore, we don't judge. We observe things as they are and see the positive impacts they bring in our process of creation. Now, this is the fourth step, is mindfully move from external to in internal reference. With an external reference, we base ourselves, our value, our satisfaction, and entire, our entire existence on the external world. Circumstances, situations, other people. So we're search, searching for approval from external situation and others, for example. And if we're living externally, then we also kind of give ourselves that permission to judge other people, right? <laughs> So, uh, if we do this, we're always fearful, you know, I'm not going to be chosen first on the ball team or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm going to embarrass myself, any of those things, because we're judging ourselves based on other folks' opinions. And again, as I think I said earlier, we have this need to control the external world. So, if we move to an internal reference... We might see the world as a reflection of ourself, but this real self, our consciousness, is free of these channels of judgment. It's free from critics, critics of itself and others, and our self has no fear of challenges. It doesn't feel inferior to anybody. Despite this, it's not an egotistical feeling. It's humble, and it doesn't judge because it's neither superior nor inferior to anybody. And lastly, practice love and compassion. Love and compassion to yourself and others helps release judgments. 
We don't judge the emotions of ourselves and, and of others. Instead, we try to understand where they come from. And of course, this feeds right into the book we're reading in Early Birds as well about planning your life. And we're discussing or we're reading about situations where a parent comes in and has handicapped children and uh, they've, the author and uh, his assistants have investigated what was really going on, you know, why this parent chose to have handicapped children, why the children chose to be handicapped, and how this was all set up prior to birth for the good of everyone. So as we practice mindfulness, we cultivate love and compassion. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh once compared our heart to a river. If we put a handful of salt in a glass, it becomes undrinkable. But if we pour the same salt in a river, the water is still 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. If our heart is as big as a river, we have the capacity to receive, embrace, and transform. There would be no place for judgment because we understand and have compassion for others. We know that where their reactions, anger, or suffering come from. As a consequence, we don't judge. This applies to ourselves as well. We don't judge ourselves because we treat ourselves with the same care we would give to a loved one or a good friend. Remind ourselves that we are imperfect humans, so let's stop judging ourselves. If you did something wrong, do you, do you really need to spend days blaming yourself? And if you find yourselves in that endless loop, recognize that you're in that loop. Let it go. You know, we say you, you, everyone is doing the very best they can with the tools they have at the moment. Let's not feel ashamed because we didn't succeed the first time. So all these are judgments we can just let go of once we learn to love ourselves. Real simple, right? <laughs> Uh, so in summary, if we want to move from loving or move to loving, healing, and evolving, we can practice the five non-judgmental mindfulness activities. You know, we become the observer that understands what's really going on within ourselves and others and are more compassionate and loving of others and ourselves. We release the judgments that keep us separate and we allow a sense of unity with all things to flow through ourselves. This allowing creates a sense of inner peacefulness and eliminates dis-ease, thereby healing our being. And just like any spiritual practice, releasing judgment and, and allowing love to flow, we evolve and become more aware of our inner divinity and unwrap the magnificent souls we truly are. And so it is. Uh, so now we have time for a prayer. I'm not quite sure where today's prayer is gonna go with us. So just, uh, let's just all allow all of us to go here. You know, first we do start prayers. We, we state an intention. And this intention is one of healing for ourselves, our friends and our family, and of the world. So let's take a moment and relax. Your mind is chattering away at you. Just tell it, okay, that's fine. We'll talk about that later. Right now we want to focus on the divinity that we truly are. 
Because we know first and foremost, we are of spirit. We are of the divine. And one way we can maybe touch into that is to imagine this golden light flowing from our head through our neck, through our torso, passing through our heart, down through our hips and our legs and our feet, and connecting to Mother Earth. So let's just take a moment and imagine that energy, that light coming through us. That light of the divine. Because we truly are made of the divine. We are God having a human experience, each and every one of us. So let's just allow that to build. And if we could see with those eyes, we would see that same energy, that same light flowing through each and every one of the members here in person and also flowing through everyone on Zoom. Every one of them is joining first with the oneness. And because we are of a like mind at this moment, through this exercise, through this prayer, the energy, the light becomes much greater than our individual light. It surrounds each of us, it moves out as little tendrils to one another, merging with one another, merging with all those on Zoom. We take a moment to just allow that to build. We feel that. Oh, and that light is much more than, than a color. It's a feeling as well. It's a feeling of peace and harmony and belonging, oneness of love. We know from that sense of love and the power that we have developed just through this small group of people. We know this same love, the same understanding, the same power, the same energy is available to our entire community, to the city of Las Cruces, to the world. And we think of those who are in need of healing, need of some peace of mind right now. And we specifically send the energy of this prayer to them. We just know as they feel this love and this support, this feeling of being one, this feeling of being home, that all their concerns, be it health, mental, peace of mind, financial, relationship-wise. We just see them breathing this comfort in and bringing toward themselves the resolution of their concerns. And we give thanks. We give thanks that we understand the power of prayer, we give thanks, we understand the power of this philosophy, we understand the power of God, we understand the power of our own creative being. So we take this prayer, this huge bundle, ball, this multi-dimensional sphere of energy, and we let it go. And we let God take it, we let God do the work.
and so it is. All right, Teresa, we have some music. Maybe I can help you with this microphone. Oh, I just need to turn it on. There it is. Thank you. That was so powerful. Thank you so much. It's just what I needed today. Um, and it reminded me of a song that I have called River of Life when you talked about the flow where you put the salt in the water and then you let the flow of spirit. And so this is called River of Life. I'm going to screw it up because I haven't done it for a long time. It's okay. Oh, oh, judge, judgment. Yeah, I may, I may screw it up, but the, you'll forgive me because that was all there was left. Why was I born? What am I to do? Where am I going next? Who the heck are you? Who knows what sweet thing it is that turns the world? Oh. Oh. oh, who knows what sweet thing it is that turns the world? Now all I see is the river of life. The river of life. All I see is the river of life. The river of life. I had a sweet romantic love. The kind I always wished I would. But we all know romantic love. Does no one any good? I prefer a love like ours, the kind that skins its knees. Now all I see is the river of life, the river of life. All I see is the river of life. We saw the Queen of Heaven once She was dancing in the sky She leaned down to whisper in our ears No one ever dies Because the love you've brought to earth Has set the whole world free now all I see is the river of life, the river of life. All I see is the river of life, the river of life. Thank you, Teresa. It's wonderful to have a repertoire where you go, oh, I can pull that song up. Very good. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where.
somehow Oh, I've got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we acknowledge and receive our virtual and in-person gifts, we give great thanks for the offerings already given and those we will be receiving because we know that giving and receiving are both part of the one flow. We affirm that we are also a part of that flow. We bless these gifts and know they are multiplied throughout our community. There are a number of folks that, who contributed to the production of the service and we are grateful for their service. And we thank you for joining us in house and on Zoom land. And speaking of Zoom land, please stay after the service to visit or if you're here, join us in the social hall. Please stand as you are able and read the benediction followed by our congregational song. Spirit in the midst of us is mighty. Joy, peace, and eternal life are our true nature and flow through us into the world. And so it is. <laughs> 